Um, yeah, it's just, it's just going to be the same as last time. So, like, um, I'll switch over to sharing my screen, and then you'll see everything that's on my screen. Okay. All right. So we, we can start whenever you're ready. And thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And, you know, thank you to everybody that came. Yeah, I'm happy to be back uh, virtually again. Uh, it's, it, it's really funny. I always feel um, I always feel bad because people will every now and then message me and say like, "Oh, I heard you're coming." Like, well, not exactly. <laughs> I'll be there, kind of, but I'm not actually physically, not yet anyway. But I do have a, a, a visit planned at some point in the you know relatively near future. So you'll be the first to know when I when I go. Can't wait. We can't wait. Okay, so this one is going to be. Uh, this is a two-part talk for, that we're doing, and the the reason the reason for that is because um, you know I remember you and I have been planning this for for a while now, but there is just this is just such a big topic. Like there is just so much stuff to find. So basically, what happened um, in the last couple months is that as I was preparing the research stuff for um our upcoming mm -hmm. talk i just kept finding like a million things that kind of merited uh further research and just you know uh jumping into that so uh before we get into the actual meat of it i just want to you know give you all kind of a uh, an overview of you see the movement <laughs> it's uh it's it's grooming time <laughs> oh, <that's just> <laughs> <quite funny. laughs> This is my life. This is <laughs> like every time that every time that anybody sees me post anything on Instagram and all that, like this is what's happening in the background. Yeah. Um, but uh, but in any case, let me let me go ahead and uh, you guys can uh, say goodbye to them. They're going to be very very small on the screen uh, in just a second. They're uh, they're at a standstill right now. Hey. <laughs> well, anyway, we'll we'll leave them to it. Um, let me go ahead and share screen here. And okay, so let me introduce you to my third child. Um, the first two are Meatball and Cooper. The third one is this database. Um, this is, I wanted just a way to kind of organize stuff for when we have talks like this. So what this is, is this is a, um, it's just a big folder with a bunch of subcategories for different French ateliers. Um, and it's, work by the teacher and work by the students. Um, it's not finished yet, but it's, you know, sort of on the way. So if we, let's say we tap into here, like Bona, right? Like everything that I've found, well, actually this was a little light, but a lot of the things that I found about, you know, Bona's atelier from paintings that were done there to studio shots to whatever, just anything that I have on it is going into that category. Um, so there's one for Bona, there's, um, there's a big one for Cabanel actually. Um, you know, here's a view of the studio. Here, just like paintings that were either produced in the studio or were done in competitions by students of his. Um, let me see. But anyway, it just it just keeps going. I mean, there are um, you know tons and tons of examples of this. Even going back, um, you know, earlier and earlier in the 19th century, and. You know, this one is particularly focused on the 19th century, just because if I did it for like every period, I would just, <laughs> I'm just never going to be able to do all that. But um, what I notice is that it's actually really useful to have this all at a glance because you start noticing similarities and differences that would be really hard to pick out otherwise. So here, I'll just give you like a quick, uh, a quick example of that. Um, let's say we go back to... I think it's, uh, is it this guy? No, it might be, okay, Garon, okay. Okay, one second, so Garon, Garon. And let me just look up real quick, I forgot who he studied with. Uh, Garon, okay, Narcisse Garon studied with Rignot. Okay, so here we'll pull up uh, Rignot as well. Okay, so let's say that we just start here, right? This is uh, an academic drawing from, you know, 
probably the probably like the mid to late 18th century by this guy Jean Baptiste Regnault. Um, Regnault, I believe, was active about the same time as David, and was actually like one of his you know one of his rivals. He had a few. So okay, this is you know sort of one way of one way of drawing. He taught this other guy Garan, right? And this is um, not the highest quality of drawing, but okay. There's this one by by Garan. This one's attribution is a little questionable, but anyway, Garan taught a number of people, including um, Delacroix, uh, Jericho. Here's a little Jericho from the studio. Here's another one that's well, attributed to Jericho. Um, here's a Delacroix cast drawing. You don't really, uh, you don't really see those every day. Um, and I'm just going to throw this out there, but this is clearly done with a stump. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and here's a, here's another uh, here's another Delacroix. There's another one of the same guy, also by Delacroix. Anyway, one of Delacroix's classmates was this guy Leon Cognier. Leon Cognier, you don't hear too much about him, but at least in my view, and particularly for you know, anyone interested in academic drawing and painting, he is super important because he's the one that trained Bona. He trained Bona and like a number of other people, right? So Raimundo Madrazo, for anyone that likes to look at those Madrazo portraits, he was also a student of uh, Leon Cognier. Uh, Jules Lefebvre, um, just a, a ton of people were in the studio with him. And this is one of his drawings. Now, if you notice already, this is fairly different, you know, from like where we started out back here with um, with this drawing by Regnault. You know, yes, there's still something of a, of a current of you know, idealization of the forms, but even here, like this is done mostly through hatching and some combination of, well, hatching and stumping really. And this one is primarily um, stumping overall and it's mostly done in black chalk. It's, uh, it might be done on colored paper, but anyway, some of these differences are starting to stack up. If we keep going, to the atelier of Cogne, things start seeing work by his students. And let's say, actually, let's grab a couple here. Um, by the way, Cogne was a contemporary of Picot, and who was actually the guy who trained Bouguereau. Um, the contemporary of De La Roche was the one who trained um, Jerome and Boulanger and a number of other people. So basically at that time, you would just have like a couple of studios that were honestly kind of interchangeable like you would learn pretty much the same things um and again there would only be like four or five or whatever um but let's say okay we take this cognier drawing here which surprisingly like a ton of these a ton of the stuff that i've been showing you actually is at um the university of north carolina chapel hill so like for whatever reason like someone got lucky i i'm sure it was just like a collector like locally they just bequeathed a bunch of stuff happen to have an interest in this but um that's the other great thing is that like this is available in the states like you couldn't even find this in france this is you know in uh north carolina so if you if you have any desire to go and see some of this like mid 19th century stuff that gave rise to a lot of the painters that, that we tend to like a lot of the more naturalistic painters you know it's um what it's like two or three hour flight away um in any case so this is by Cognier. This is a drawing by Bonat. We don't have a lot of surviving academic drawings by Bonat from a student period. This is from when he went to Rome. He never won the Prix de Rome, but he just kind of went on his own anyway. A few people did that. Um, Degas did that too, actually. And funny enough, there's actually a drawing by, I think it's by Degas, of the same model in the same pose as this, uh, as this Bonat. Because they were, um, yeah, I could probably find it right now, actually. Um, you know, they were buddies. So I, I think Rome might actually have been where they, um, where they met. Um, I know I have one by Moreau, actually, of the same model. I might not have the Degas. But here's the Bona, here's the Moreau. Also interesting because very, very different interpretations of the same model posing. You can start to see with... Uh, Bonat, there's this kind of increasing, what you might call this sort of like optical or photographic kind of naturalism. You know, this is around 1860. So this is, you know, well into the era of photography. You know, they've had working photographs for like almost 40 years at this point. Um, anyway, if we go from 
Bona and then moved to say Croyer, who was a student of Bona, we end up here. This is one of Croyer's drawings that he did at the Atelier uh, in 1877. Also interesting, like also, you know, done with a stump, a lot of uh, sort of telltale signs over here. Um, there's another there's another drawing that's similar to this one that's unfinished. Uh, let me dig that up actually. Here we go up. Atelier Bonam. Oh, and actually, here's another here's another Bona, very likely also from, uh, or sorry, Croyer, very likely from Bona Studio as well. And here's here's a, a drawing that's uh, anonymous, like they don't know who did it technically, but I mean, like, what are the odds? You know, this is the model that you have in that in that painting that you own. Uh, it's the same guy. It's from the 1870s. You know, he was a regular in the studios. I mean, even the paper looks the same. What are the odds that this isn't another Croyer? It's in the same collection. They probably got it from the same person. Anyway, whether it's a Croyer or not is actually kind of immaterial to this. What you can see here is, again, you know, sort of like charcoal. Here's a, the, this is either charcoal or Conte, just sort of in its raw form. And here on the sides, you can see it after it's been smoothed over with the, with the stump. Here again, you can see that there's a smoother application. And you can tell that it's laid paper, which pretty much all academic, um, academic drawings were done on. But anyway, when you look at this, or I mean any of these really, it is just so, you know, completely different. It, it really, I mean, just worlds apart from that Regnault that we started with, right? And this is like in a span of, I want to say maybe like a hundred years. And it's not like, there's a direct line, like from person to person to person, right? From teacher to student, to, to, then to, you know, another student and another student and another student. But somehow we start here and we end up over here. And these are just a completely different um, sort of like theories of what's of what's real, of what's important, of what's, you know, what what's um, what a figure drawing should be. And again, this is just like in a hundred years. Right. So this is part of what I started noticing that basically like within a period of about 20 to 30 years, there's usually a fairly significant shift in what academic drawings look like. This is all in Paris too, by the way. Like this isn't even like, you know, across like different countries and across like centuries. Like I said, it's like about a hundred years of difference. Um, so you can only imagine like how big those changes become, you know, once you actually do start, you know, kind of, uh, you know, schlepping through the, through the centuries. This I think is one of the most telling examples. Uh, this is a drawing by Michelangelo that is, you know, pretty clearly mapping out a system of proportions for the figure, right? And it has this particular sensibility. I mean, I don't think anybody would dispute, you know, the, in a sense, like the, the veracity of this drawing. I mean, it's, it's real in the sense that, you know, everybody has these muscles, everybody has these ribs, you know, everybody has all of these features. People are, in fact, three-dimensional. Um, you know, these forms do fit in in a particular in a particular rhythmical pattern. And yet, in most modern ateliers, let's say, if someone were to make this, I think for most teachers it would be baffling, right? And it's just that. So, I mean, but but what is it like? If you were to submit this as a student at a modern school, I think for the most part <laughs> you'd be asked to do it again. But why is that? I mean, like if Michelangelo were to enroll in a modern atelier, like what, what would he do? Would, would he be bad at drawing? Well, you know, that's that's sort of what we're going to get into. I mean, what it is, it's a completely different outlook. And again, it has to do with just a completely different way of looking at the world and a different set of um, uh, the philosophical commitments. The one on the right is a drawing by Dennis Miller Bunker, who um, was an American Impressionist. He died when he was like 29. So he had some amount of influence, particularly in Boston, but obviously, I mean, he was, he was really young when he died, and so he, he didn't have a chance to, you know, sort of fully, for his work to fully blossom into what, what it might have been. Um, but this is approached from a completely different point of view, and I think that's actually most telling when you look down here at the legs, which both of them didn't uh, think it was worth their time to finish. <laughs> Like if you look at this, like this is approached from this is almost like a, like a wire armature with clay being added to it, right? 
And, and so from the initial lines, because it's not a question of this being more rendered than this. This is a complete thought, right? Just like this is a complete thought. They're just very different kinds of thoughts. So again, this is like a kind of virtual sculpting. Whereas this over here is built on this principle of, you know, interpreting sort of like a mosaic of interlocking two-dimensional shapes, right? And the interesting thing about this is this was done in Jerome's atelier. I think it was done like in 1883 or 1885. Um, his handwriting is about as bad as mine, so it's difficult to, to make out what it says. But, you know, even in Jerome's studio, like in the same studio with the same teacher, there was, there was kind of a shift in what people were looking for in their drawings, you know, across a span of, I forget how long Jerome was teaching for, 1863 to maybe like 40 years or something like that. Um, but in any case, you know, what I want to get into today is kind of, um, it's not exactly like a historical analysis, and it's not, it's definitely not a technical analysis. Um, what I want to do more than anything is offer a kind of try to disentangle some of this like huge mess that we have because this is just like a messy kind of history of um, of drawing and and offer maybe like a little bit of food for thought you know just to question some of the assumptions that I think a lot of us have that honestly we've heard so much they just seem like they're the truth but you know that there's a lot to unpack there. I'm, I'm not optimistic about getting through all of it, but um, like I said, I want to lay some groundwork for getting into more of the 19th century nitty gritty um, next week. So anyway, let's just look at a couple of other drawings. This is, uh, this is by Drolling. This is by, uh, I actually don't know who this one's by, but it's you know a Nicole student from the 18, 1880s, just about, again, you know, short time period. This is maybe, I think this is this was from like 1810, I think. This is like 70 years. Same material, same like pretty much everything, except for the purpose. The purpose is is different. Um, in a sense, I mean, when you when you look at some of this stuff, you know, like when you look at say like this uh, this drawing by uh, Bandinelli from I think like the 1500s, or you look at this Raphael. And then you look at, you know, let's say this Bonat or this Cognier or even, actually, let's look at, um, let's look at this Fabre over here, even something like that. Like, how are these even the same thing? Okay, these are all sort of falling into the category for the most part of academic drawings. Um, if we pick out, say, this one by Kenyon Cox, uh, this is sort of a funny one. He wrote a letter home to his mom about this and he was complaining about um, what a bad spot he got and uh, you know how he wasn't able to do anything good because you know he couldn't even see the face and he was you know over off to the to the side and everybody else got a better place and whatever but um this by the way is in new york oh it's at the at the cooper hewitt museum which is i guess a branch of one of the smithsonian museums so if you want to go see this um it's in your town and it's actually a a really great document of it. It's a good drawing. It's not a great drawing. You know, it didn't again didn't win any prizes at the um, during one of the uh, the judgments. Um, these did though. You know, these are the same the same model. Same judgment, November eighteen seventy eight, I think. Actually, it's actually pretty funny. Like this. This guy got like almost the same angle, you know. He wasn't he wasn't complaining. <laughs> but in any case, um, again, it's it's difficult to kind of parse like how. Again, like what what would happen if this were submitted to like one of the ARC competitions, <laughs> you know, or like or just like submitted as atelier work like in any in any studio today, you, know, you get laughed out of the room. Like, look at this guy, right? It's like a bird. Um, and part of that is like even considering like, for instance, Charles Le Brun, right, who was one of the founders, he was like Mr. French Academy uh, when the Academy was founded in, I believe, 1648. Um, this is like the father of French academic drawing and painting. 
Like, <laughs> I mean, look at this. Like, you, again, you would get literally just laughed out of the room um, if you were to show this, like, chupacabra cat. <laughs> you know, for like any of your assignments in any in any studio, like you know, walk in, hello, here's my cast drawing, and here's a camel man. Oh my God, camel man. <laughs> oh my God, that's awesome. Yeah, these these are part of this really like um, one of the things that he's known for was um, this this lecture that he gave about drawing what he called the passions, which is usually what they called like different emotions at the time. And so he had this like really outlandish theory. I don't think he was alone in this either, but that people share the qualities of animals that they look like. So like if you look like a hawk, then you might be like, I don't know, brave and like cunning. Or if you look like a cow, I don't know, I guess you might be like sturdy. Uh, if you look like an owl, then I don't know, you're probably wise, I'm guessing. Uh, but again, like, like this is, again, this is, French academic drawing at a certain point. It, uh, again, clearly not side size, by the way. Um, <laughs> but it is just such an entirely foreign point of view. Th this looks more like drawing for animation today. You know, in in the sense that you're conceptualizing, you know, different volumes. I think I think these are like little cherubs in the making, right? And so this is I th a thing that I think is really important in these drawings, how they get started. Right, so like this is basically like a sphere or an ovoid, you know, conceived in 3D, with you know like a, a line wrapped around it to indicate where the eyes are, wrapped around in 3D space. And all of this, again, is is conceived on that plan. Um, eventually, as time goes on, you know, you end up with um, some of the hallmark drawings of the uh, of the Academy Royale, which. Um, you know, the, uh, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which is, you know, the, the 19th century version of the big French academic school, it went through a bunch of different names. It went through, like, a few different buildings. You know, it's, it's had a very, you know, storied uh, past in the almost 400 years that it's been around. And, again, it's been around in a bunch of different ways. This is eventually what, you know, academic drawing was codified into. This is eventually what it became. Um, you know, a lot of it was done on tone paper. Uh, it's also done, you know, a lot of the underlying stuff is done with a stump, usually followed by hatching on top, and then eventually, you know, some kind of heightening with, uh, you know, some form of white chalk. And this this is actually, I think this is actually a painting from life, by the way. Um, you can tell that, again, the point of view is just so completely different from, you know, what we do today. I mean, again, consider, an atelier student making this today, walking in with, okay, here's my nude figure, and here's this like, like cotton candy dream landscape that I made up. You know, it's like, it, it's a completely different sensibility, even from, again, something like this, where there's no fanciful background, there's no, there's no question, this is just a naked guy in a room, right? Whereas this is sleeping in Endymion. I don't know who Indinion is, but but this is a very sort of typical example of you know kind of early neoclassicism. You know, growing out of you know growing out of the exuberance of the Rococo, you still see bits of that. Um, and again, basically irreproachable in terms of the anatomical realities and the the, the three dimensional feeling of this. But again, to modern eyes, this doesn't. I don't think this would pass as real. I don't think anybody would look at this and think. Oh yeah, that's what people look like. So anyway, here's a couple more examples. Again, these are all like very early, you know, well, not very early actually, like um, late 18th century academic work. Here's one by the same guy, this is uh, Jean-Bernard Restoux. This is, you know, probably a study in preparation for this painting of uh, Morpheus. So again, a tremendous amount of knowledge going into this. And, you know, this, this is not a, a timid painting. It's not like he didn't know what he was doing. And again, when you compare this to that, there's something very different in the treatment of say, even like, you know, this area here, or even this arm, where, where here it's almost conceived as, you know, it's gradually becoming almost like just a, a graphic shape or a silhouette. 
Whereas here, there, there's never a sense that you lose this three-dimensional conception of this form as a form in space, as an arm that has a certain mechanism for it to work. Um, in fact, even that even filters into the application. You know, you look at how hatched this is, you know, going across the form, right? To in some way, almost like using a rake in sculpture, to constantly, constantly, constantly reinforce this idea that this is a three-dimensional um, figure existing in space. Whereas, again, here, there isn't the same, um, particularly, say, when you get to a spot like this, there isn't the same insistence on that three-dimensional quality. You know, it's almost like a, like a snapshot uh, kind of painting, uh, you know, more of a... Um, it's not entirely like a purely optical thing, but it but it is leaning more in that direction. So anyway, now that we have at least a little bit of context there, what I want to get into is actually this is a uh, bear with me here because this is going to seem like it's coming out of left field, but <clears throat> there's this thing called the coastline paradox, right? The coastline paradox is basically this observation. This is, here it is in Wikipedia. Um, that, like, let's say you, you know, ask Google what the how big, how long the coast of Great Britain is, right? And it'll like spit out an answer if you just Google that. But the issue with that is that, you know, you you get this sense that there's a there's a real true answer to that question. But that's not actually the case. So as it turns out, because a coastline has you know, features and sort of like in and outs and little divots and things at every scale, the length of it changes depending on how you measure it. So here's the example, like the more, if you measure it with say like, a, and you might recognize this as something similar to like a block in, right? Where you're taking, you know, the say quote unquote, true outline or true boundary of something and you're, you know, simplifying it with these approximations. If the size of these units is in this case 62 miles long, then you get a coast that measures 1,700 uh, miles. If you use smaller units that are 50, uh, they're 31 miles, then all of a sudden the coast is over 2,000 miles. So you somehow now it's like almost like 400 miles longer, right? And if you keep making the units smaller, that distance keeps that distance keeps getting bigger, right? Okay, so. What does this have to do with anything? The, what this has to do with is that you can have multiple answers to one question existing at once, like at different scales of observation or at different, at different levels. And part of what that, you know, the implication of that is that you, you're basically, well, all of us, we live in this world where we have just like, more information that we can ever sift through, right? I mean, we just have mountains and mountains and mountains of observation and or, uh, information. And just when you feel like you can kind of grab onto something, you know, like if you change the scale, like there's, you're always missing out on something. Let's say you're always choosing something. Um, for instance, if you were to ask somebody, you know, like how, how tall is an adult human, right? There isn't, like one answer that you could give, right? You can't just say like, oh, five, seven, all right, case closed, um, that answers that. You know, everybody knows that people can be taller or they can be shorter, but at the same time, so, so you can have all of these um, answers to that question. And yet that doesn't mean that every single answer is correct in any sense, or that, like you can't just throw out a number. You can't just say that like, oh, well, there isn't one number that you can pin it down to. So like, I don't know, people can be any height because that's not true. People can't be 20 feet tall. They can't be zero feet tall either, right? So you have these, you know, these sort of constraints um, around that. And, you know, we're always dealing with that kind of thing in the sense that we have this field of information and we need a way to kind of narrow it down so that we can navigate the world. But at the same time, as you keep narrowing down and narrowing down and narrowing down, the information starts to be sort of like less and less useful, 
right? So if you decide that people can't be 200 feet tall and they can't be zero feet tall, okay, that's one thing. Um, maybe you narrow it down further and say, well, people can't be 20 feet tall either. They can't be one foot tall for the most part either. So, okay, you start to get closer, that starts to get more accurate. But there's a certain point where that accuracy works against you. You definitely can't narrow it down to like, you know, a range of like 10 inches, let's say, right? Okay, so where am I going with this? The idea is basically the same when you're making a drawing. You're faced with so much information when you look at a model and you're always choosing. And by choosing something, you're not choosing a bunch of other things, right? And so in the quest to make something quote unquote accurate, I mean, let's say like how long an arm is on a model. You can't make the arm twice as long as the person. That is definitely not the answer that pretty much anybody's looking for. Um, you know, the arm also can't be like super tiny, let's say, on most people. But, but let's say that as you narrow it down, as it starts to get like, um, you know, within the range of what most people would find believable, then pursuing that further and further and further and further and further until you get to like, I don't know, what you might consider like 100% accuracy, um, it takes up more and more time and it doesn't actually uh, make the drawing that much more believable because part of what you're, what you're working with is a constantly moving thing. It's like the coastline thing again. Okay, even with the different scales of measuring a coastline, what, like a coastline in, in a sense is constantly changing. You know, it's, the tide is constantly coming in and out. It's constantly kind of eroding parts of the, you know, uh, part of the, the actual land mass. And so in what sense can you even measure a coastline, right? Because it doesn't sit still. And yet somehow we manage, like somehow we're able to come up with like answers that are, you know, reasonable enough that we can, you know, that, that we can actually like do something with that information. Um, and I think the same thing is true of drawing. Again, you have all this information um, available to you when you look at a person. And so the answers that you're looking for you know, the, will be determined by the questions that you ask. So if we go back to, you know, some of these drawings, like something like this versus, or say something like this versus something like this, the observations about the model might be sort of equally based on reality, right? They might be sort of like equally there. Like this person does, in fact, you know, have like certain muscles and certain you know, they, they're arranged in a certain way, they have a certain number of fingers, um, you know, existing in space, et cetera, et cetera. And here, for instance, you know, you get more information, let's say about like, you know, light and shade and the overall tonal effect, but you maybe don't get the same articulation of the muscles as parts of like the viable, uh, viable machine, let's say, like a, like a movable actual uh, mechanism. Like I say, if you get in here, this actually looks pretty flat overall. It looks more like pattern than, than anything else. Um, you look over here and this is conceived in, in 3D. But these are substantially like when, you know, when Javier Fabre and when Kenyon Cox were looking at a model, I mean, it was like a seated model in a pose that's I mean, not entirely dissimilar. So they had similar phenomena in front of them and yet the decisions that they made were completely different, right? Does that make sense? And so that's part of the issue that we're constantly facing because, you know, we, we have these notions and I'm sure everybody's heard this before. You know, you get these notions that, you know, there's truth in drawing, that your drawing is accurate, that your drawing is, you know, and this is kind of an interesting, um, uh, interesting sort of development that you get to a certain point where like this idea of naturalism becomes associated with the truth and it takes on a kind of moral dimension where like if you, if your drawing is not accurate, it's basically tantamount to lying, you know, so like you're doing a bad thing if you're not 
wholly devoted to, you know, copying, you know, every slight variation of like every angle, let's say, uh, on the model that you see. And this is something that you see 19th century painters actually um, struggle with, right? So there's like this, there's this whole body of literature in here. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and find some of that, um, that basically deals with, a lot of it was published like around like the late 19th century to the early 20th century. And it's basically like these people that were, you know, trained to do a certain kind of drawing, wrestling with the fact that that kind of drawing might not give them what they're looking for, right? Or at least that, you know, the the sort of um, the way that, you know, people were doing figure drawing in the West was very different than the way that it started, say, in the Renaissance. So here's an example. This is by uh, George Clausen, who's a 19th century uh, naturalist painter. Uh, he's a big um, follower of Bastien Lepage. This is probably one of, his, one of his more famous paintings. This is about typical of what you would expect from like, you know, late 19th century naturalism. Um, you know, there's a tremendous concern for uh, tonal relationships and getting everything at like the right pitch and making sure that there's this, you know, harmonious relationship between every part of the, um, of the picture, right? And, you know, there's, there's also significant development in terms of the form and everything, you know, it's not, it's not quite impressionism or anything like that, but, but it's definitely based on, you know, very, um, on studying a model very intensely, right? And studying like the sort of optical qualities of a, of a model. Um, but then he goes on to say this, this is later in his career. He's talking about um, the drawings of Raphael and he's talking about uh, the drawings of Aang and he's talking about this idea of style, right? And this is something that actually comes up in a lot of these books. It's not, they're not just talking about um, accurate drawing, they're talking about this sort of elusive quality that they call style. Now, what he says here is, the main point about these drawings is that they are drawn from construction. That is, from an intelligent understanding of how a figure is put together, not from unthinkingly copying the model just as he happens to be at the moment, as is so often done in life schools. Of course, in drawing a model, one has to copy him, but it should be borne in mind that one gains the most, not by imitating the model, but by trying to learn from him, so that when our student days are over, and we may have, perhaps, but a short time to make a drawing from life, or may even have to draw from memory, we can bring some store of knowledge to bear on our work. Otherwise, we are helpless, unless we can get long sittings. Raphael's drawing cannot have taken him more than half an hour, but there is everything in it. And Michelangelo's drawings also show the swift application of great knowledge. I do not think we could have a better method of drawing, uh, drawing from life than that of Raphael and Michelangelo. And one may instance Alfred Stevens, Millet, and Watts as showing the influence of this fine tradition. You know, that's, I think, a fairly surprising statement, you know, to say champion, you know, these drawings by Raphael. Here, let's, um, let's pull this up so we can get a closer look at this. Uh, let's see. Oh, actually. There we go. And it's one of the annoying things about uh, archive.org. We don't always have the best way of like, you know, sort of managing with like pages that are um, turned to the side. But again, it's like, it's pretty surprising to hear like the person that made this, you know, go on to, uh-oh, where we go? <laughs> The champion, you know, like this drawing by Raphael. And what's interesting is that this actually comes up in several authors. Like it's not, it's not just, um, it's not just Clausen talking about this. You know, the beginning part of Harold Speed's um, uh, Practice and Science of Drawing is actually, well, I mean, the whole book is this kind of reckoning with the legacy of 19th century art and what that sort of became. Now, the main thrust of his argument 
is that as the 19th century progressed, you know, we basically ended up with these, um, you know, this this uh, this large emphasis on these kinds of um, optical uh, sort of imitative qualities that you know have to do more with like exactly how the model might look like, almost in a sort of photographic sense. And his argument is that we lost in getting so absorbed in that we lost some of the expressive power that comes from you know more in a sense kind of like more abstract forms of drawing like the kind of power of a symbol that you might get with like i don't know like in like a like an egyptian sphinx or like an olmec sculpture you know the kind of formal power of you know let's say an image or a sculpture or a painting or whatever just as a symbol rather than as a representation of, you know, an actual, uh, an actual person. But anyway, this is a really interesting chapter and it's very much worth, uh, worth reading. And we'll, we'll come back to particularly this idea in, uh, in just a second, but this is a bad scan. Uh, this is, this is, uh, Edward Pointer who actually studied in France and he's, um, He's actually one of the people that went off about, um, you know, like the, the really long drawings they were doing in England. Uh, I think I brought that up last time. Uh, he had plenty to say about, um, you know, what he called a, a search for a, a trivial minuteness of form. Or, uh, sorry, a trivial minuteness of execution at the expense of, of form. But let's see what he has to say about, um, let's see, the higher points. Is this what you guys were talking about when you put in the keyword in there? Or are you just more starting? Starting at the gate. Okay. Yeah. I'm just there, right? So here, this, this is an interesting thing that he mentions. And this is like about like 18, 1879 is when the whole book was published. So the lectures are from 1879 or a little bit before that. Um, he says, the importance of the correct perception of tone has given rise in France to a system of drawing by tone merely, to the ignoring of constructive drawing. The result is that there is no school where tone, or as they call it, les valeurs, is better understood. And then he goes on to say how like the English don't really study, you know, the tone. Tone in this case, to them means something different than light and shade. What they mean by tone is, you know, studying the relationship, the harmonious relationship of every tone in the picture. So you know, there's this idea that if you're going to study tone, like you can study modeling by just having light and shade kind of almost arbitrarily, at like almost any scale that you want. But if you're going to study tone, you have to include the background because tone has to do, has to do with all of the relationships of everything, you know, that you're looking at. But anyway, that's besides the point. So what he says here is, there is no necessity for carrying matters to this extreme. Uh, what he was saying a little bit earlier is that the French became so absorbed in just, you know, the the appearance of, of like sort of optic, uh, natural appearances that um, a female head or a piece of raw meat being looked upon as equally suitable for the exercise of their skill in painting. So part of what he's saying is that like people became so absorbed in the kind of formal qualities that everything is sort of like up for grabs, like everything is just another set of tones and another set of colors to be represented. It doesn't matter like, you know, what the actual subject is, whether it's a person or it's, you know, a steak or it's an onion or something, like it's all sort of the same thing. Now, Pointer doesn't like that. Um, he says, there's no necessity for carrying matters to this extreme. The great Italian painters were nonetheless masters of tone because they devoted themselves to the study of form and to the higher points of construction and ideal beauty. Then he goes on to say that it must be kept in mind that no amount of anatomical or constructional knowledge of drawing is of value without a true perception of tone, right? So he is also against the idea of making um, what, um, I forget what Renaissance painter said this, it might have been uh, Leonardo, but uh, he called drawings that showed a kind of um, overemphasis on anatomical knowledge uh, sacco di noci, which I guess means like bag of walnuts, you know, so like sort of like 
lumpy looking. Uh, nothing is quite in its sort of like proper relationship to everything else. Everything's sort of over overemphasized. But um, this gets us to another point that I think is really important. You notice that with Pointer, <laughs> with Pointer, there's um, he has a very firm conviction that ideal beauty is a thing that exists and it's a thing worth striving for, right? And that's the whole thing about this is that when you draw, like when you look at the world, when you look at a model and all the information that is available to you, like we said before, you cannot record all of it, right? You don't have the time or the energy or like we're always filtering things. You know, and I'm sure you're all, I mean, I'm sure you all experience that all the time. You live in New York City, right? So you can't like hear and see everything even walking to like the metro stop or the, the subway stop because you'd be overwhelmed, right? And, and we're all really good at this. There was, um, I forget what it was called, but there was this experiment a long time ago where basically what they did is they, they asked people, they showed people a video and they asked them to count, um, the people were playing basketball, to count the number of passes from like one person to like another person. And so the participants are so engrossed in doing this that they don't notice that halfway through the video, there's a guy in a monkey suit that walks by. And at the end, they're like, did you see the guy in the monkey suit? And they're like, what are you talking about? And they play the video back and there's like, there's a guy in a gorilla suit walking by. But we're always doing this. You know, I'm sure, again, people have the experience of like, if you're walking or driving or something and you're going back home and you don't remember how you got there, you were just kind of running on, on automatic in a sense. You know, maybe you're thinking about your taxes. Maybe you're thinking about like what you're going to eat when you get home or whatever. And so even though you're like, you're there for the driving or you're there for the walking, you know, your mind is sort of elsewhere, right? And that's the thing that when you're drawing and when you're looking at anything, when you're just living, period, uh, you are constantly filtering things out that aren't important to you, right? Depending on you know, what, uh, what your priority happens to be at that, at that moment. Um, <clears throat> and so one of the, well, one of the things about that is that you actually have to have, and I think this is just true of all of us, is that you live your life through stories. Like we sort of engage with the facts, but it's not a direct engagement. You know, we can't know everything all at once. And so what we do is we develop these kind of mental models of things. Um, and that is kind of like how we actually see the world. Now, when someone like Pointer, you know, has this idea of beauty, ideal beauty, and, and here you can even see, like, if you keep reading, you know, that there's this tone throughout, and a lot of authors do this, where there's an association between, like, beauty and kind of, like, what's morally right, right? And so... Again, you start to get this kind of sense that there's this kind of like, there's a right thing to do. There's like an academic tradition. There's this thing that like, you know, there's a wrong way to draw. There's a right way to draw. But I think that all of that is actually kind of uh, nonsense or maybe not exactly that. But the idea that there's like one way of learning how to draw, there's one way of being able to, you know, to, to engage with the world, it just doesn't bear out. You start seeing in all these drawings that, um, you know, people with different points of view, again, un under very similar conditions, you know, looking at, say, a model sitting, they get completely different um, answers, right? <clears throat> and so I think that, you know, one of the important things to consider is that we live in a time where, like, we don't really have any sort of like central committee or central like academy like telling us like what we have to focus on. And that actually gives us a kind of tremendous freedom. But at the same time, we have sort of a, a responsibility to ourselves to um, decide what it is that we want. Right. So you have all this, all this freedom to choose. Like you can choose like any, you know, any given thing from like almost any historical period. You know, you can choose to draw like this if you want. You can choose to draw you know, like that. Um, but I think what happens too often is that, you know, when, when people are interested in representational art, there's such, there's so much of this idea of like tradition, of drawing correctly, of, you know, this, this weight of the past that 
that, that I think that's why people become so dogmatic in their approaches, you know, because they're like, this is the way to do this thing. Um, when again, you know, just like what we were talking about earlier with say like, you know, like, I don't know how, how tall is like an, an adult uh, human, um, you can have any number of answers that are all sort of like equally, um, valuable, let's say, um, now, drawing basically, in a sense, is a form, like I was saying, of, uh, of storytelling. And that's basically what design is, that you're, you're constantly choosing one thing and not another thing. And I think in that sense, even like art is, you know, you creating an experience for someone else to have. You sort of like, you know, taking these, um, taking these tools for visual expression and communicating something to another person. Um, and so I think that actually has to be borne in mind that, again, there's, you're only sort of right in a sense, like naturalism, I think, comes with a lot of this baggage, where particularly, I think, today, we think like, oh, yeah, when you see a drawing that's quote unquote, like naturalistic, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, that's like, that's, that, that's right, that's true, that's realistic. But realistic in what sense? People are not monochrome or at least most of us don't see people as, as monochrome, right? When you make a drawing that's naturalistic, it's still on a flat page, basically, right? It doesn't move like the person moves. It doesn't smell like the person smells. It doesn't, um, it's not actually three-dimensional like the person is. So in what sense is a natural, naturalistic drawing true? You know, it's, it's true in a very limited sense. And, you know, for instance, I would make the, the argument that you know, a naturalistic drawing is not, it's not necessarily any more true than one of these. You know, it's a different set of facts that are being extracted here to tell a certain kind of story, let's say. Uh, here, it's a story of three dimensionality. And that's basically, you know, all it is. It doesn't have to be like a, a three act, you know, like play. It's just, it can be a very sort of, uh, you know, simple recounting of like, again, a certain experience, like, oh, this is, you know, the space that people occupy when they lie down like this, or whatever. Um, and so I think if we, if we start to kind of, um, you know, acknowledge that these things are being made from a completely different point of view than the one that we have, you start to notice that these drawings, that what they do is like they, they make sense as an explanation for certain things, right? And so Harold Speed has a really good discussion about this. And here, let's actually go ahead and I'm just going to draw something real quick. So okay, now I realize that a lot of this is very sort of like wide ranging. Right, so it's it's difficult to see like how does this actually connect to drawing, but again, you are going to make choices every time you're faced with a model or something that you want to draw. So let's say that you're going to draw a tree, right? And let's say this is going to be you know a realistic representation of that tree. Part of it is that you have to decide like what aspect of reality is the one that matters to you. You know, you could go about it this way. You could say, okay, well, you know what I see is, you know, this arrangement, this kind of jigsaw puzzle of shapes, and these shapes are each different, and they have a different tone assigned to them. you know, et cetera, et cetera, like in context, let's say, like, let's, let's say that's a tree, right? Uh, just by the arranging of a bunch of different uh, two-dimensional shapes, like this kind of jigsaw puzzle, you can arrive at something that in context feels like a tree, right? Now, from a distance, I mean, that might actually replicate the experience that you have in your retinas of seeing a tree, right? If you're 40 feet away from that tree, like you're not seeing leaves and branches and, you know, like the bark and all that stuff. And yet that stuff is actually always there, right? So another point of view here 
could be that you think of a tree, well, you think, okay, well, trees have trunks. They grow from the ground up. You know, this part bifurcates and you start getting branches. You know, these branches have leaves on them. You know, the leaves will have a certain character. This will take up a certain amount of space in 3D. You know, so let's say this will be in front of these back here. And you can arrive at something that what you're studying there is you're studying the three-dimensional information of the tree and also how the tree is built, right? So not just, not what it looks like exactly, but the sort of logic underlying that tree. Now, this applies to basically everything. Um, you could do the same for like a, a person. And this is the same example that you basically see in, um, in Herald Speed. Let's see, when we go back to this, right, he's talking about like, you know, children's drawings and, you know, just sort of like the, the outline outside of this and like indicating every tooth and the nose is a triangle and all that versus another kind of representation that might just be, again, like this kind of arrangement of shapes. Um, these are flipped around, but it's basically the same idea as over here. This is basically the same thing that you run into. Oops, let's go back over here. Got to find my Michelangelo. Oh, here we go. This is basically the same idea here. And actually, I should have, let me move these so this isn't so confusing. Oops, not liquefy. That's more or less what's happening here as well, right? That here you have a prioritizing of the way that the figure is built, right, in three-dimensional space as a tactile experience. Um, whereas looking at this one, you know, this is more grounded in that idea of this kind of jigsaw puzzle of shapes, right? And again, this is well, Michelangelo is clearly pre-photography. This is clearly post-photography. Um, at, at a glance, I mean, this actually doesn't look that different from, you know, an early photograph, right? And so, <clears throat> you know, Harold Speed, like I said, has a really interesting discussion about this because what he's saying is that this type of outlook is associated with the sense of touch, whereas this is associated with the sense of sight. And I think those are good observations. I mean, like, if you think of something like hatching, like what is hatching? Why, did, why is hatching a thing? Why are there drawings where you can see like a leg like this and then, you know, there's all this stuff wrapping around like that. Like for instance, um, you know, if we look at, let's see, where's this Michelangelo? There's a bunch of really funny ones uh, in here from you know, very silly drawings from a long time ago. Some great horses. Let me see. Oh, also, stick figures. Very old. These are from the 18th century. Oh, and this one, actually, this one's good, too. All right, now, let me just find this Michelangelo here. Oh, this is a good one too. And so is this one. Oh, here we go. It was a snake, it would have bit. Um, you know, here, to give the idea of form, he just wraps lines around 
you know, this, this volume. And okay, you can change the same trend here. And maybe it more or less corresponds to like a light and shadow pattern. But primarily, the idea is that these curving lines are showing the kind of topography of the form. Now, when you get up here into the hatching, it, the hatching is basically just more of this. It's just kind of like disguised and it's, you know, given it sort of different values to, to simulate a light source. But this is all kind of like, you know, sculpting. It's all just kind of like digging things in. So in the end, what this is, is basically hatching is a three, it's like a, it's a mental projection of what it would feel like to touch the actual surface, right? As if you were like, you know, like a little bug crawling around the surface of this form. Um, what's interesting is that this has been a debate for a long time. Right, and this is an older way of drawing. It seems like this is this response to certain instincts that we develop. Um, Harold Speed has this great thing about this that you know I very much agree with. Um, when you look at you know like babies spend a lot of their time like touching things, right? And for the most part, I mean, when they're really little, they bump into stuff, they fall a lot. What is happening there is that by touching all this stuff, they're building this association between the way certain things look and the way that they would actually feel in 3D space, right? Like when you're touching something, you're building a kind of mental model of, um, of what that thing looks like. So if you like touch a chair or something, like, and you ask a, like a, a, a kid to draw a chair or somebody who hasn't had training in drawing, you know, they might draw something like that. And this is true in a sense. Like they're taking sort of inventory of like, all right, four legs, then like, Tabletop, maybe the tabletop is actually more like squarish like that. Um, or maybe it's round like this and you have the legs like that. You know, they're not going to draw the actual visual appearance of that. Let's say you can only see like, I don't know, three of the legs and another one's hidden. Um, because this isn't actually that useful to you in your everyday life. You know, this, the, what, this table happens to look like this from this one angle, this one time. Like, so what you know like you're just gonna you're just gonna move in like two seconds so you know what you're trying to do most of the time most of us trying to do is extract information about the world and so what harold speed calls this and this is a an interesting turn of phrase um Oh, it was on that page. Okay, great. So what he says is, um, so, and he's talking about most people in general, people that haven't had, you know, sort of a certain kind of training and drawing. Um, the sense of vision is neglected and relegated to be the handmaiden of other senses. It is no wonder that in the average adult, it is in such a shocking state of neglect. I feel that I feel that with the great majority of people, vision is seldom, if ever, consulted for itself, but only to minister to some other sense. They look at the sky to see if it's going to be fine, at the fields to see if they are dry enough to walk on, or whether there will be a good crop of hay, at the stream not to observe the beauty of the reflections from the blue sky or green fields dancing upon its surface, or the rich coloring of its shadowed depths, but to calculate how deep it is or how much power it would supply to work a mill. So, what he's saying is that we have this very kind of utilitarian um, use for vision, right? Like you only kind of glance at stuff and be like, oh, okay, is it nice outside? It is nice outside. Okay, great. But you don't really take note of like, wow, what a captivating, I don't know, turquoise color at like this particular part of the sky. Um, most people don't engage with sight that way because again, it's actually not super useful for most people's uh, lives. Um, and Here's, so here, here's another thing. Like we said, the things that you draw, you know, the way that you approach, the, they have to do with how you approach the world. You know, it's like, there's this great example that I remember reading about, and I think it's like something that's come up in some of the Russian academies, that um, there's a debate between like, what do you render when you look at a figure? Like, is it, like, what, what's real about a figure? Is it the forms? Or is it, you know, the, I mean, because the forms are the actual physical matter, right? 
So that's, I mean, that's really real enough, right? The sense of weight, the arrangement of those forms. But there's the argument that, yeah, 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 okay, fine. But you can only see forms when they're revealed to you through light. So maybe the light is the thing that you should represent, not the, you know, not the forms themselves, because you never see the forms on their own. You always see them through, through light and shade. The, the counter argument to that is, yeah, but like if you shut off all the lights and you can't see anything, if you reach out and touch something, it's still, it's still there. The world doesn't disappear because you turn off the lights. And again, I don't think either one of those is necessarily, um, like they're both based on reality. One of them is not a, a better point of view than the other one. But I think it pays to be very aware of what you're making and what, what kind of direction you want your work to, to go in. So <clears throat> beyond just this purely abstract notion of, you know, thinking in 3D and thinking of the sense of touch and, you know, hatching being this kind of mental projection of the sense of touch, right? That's really what it is. It's like a little trail of what it would feel like to actually like touch that, touch that form, you know? It's like you're wrapping like rubber bands around that, around that form, let's say. Um, beyond that, this actually ties into, you know, a persistent trend in Western culture, like over the last, you know, couple of centuries. So a lot of our thinking, it, it's still, it, we still have these kind of like leftover ideas from um, like Plato basically uh, developed these and eventually, you know, these platonic ideas started influencing Christianity. The basic notion there is that, you know, you have this reality that we see all the time, right? And this is, you know, this is, uh, I'm going to sound like every sort of philosophy 101 asshole for a second. But, uh, but basically, it's, it's the whole like, idea of that, like the, like the cave analogy, right? It's like, we are in this world and we have limited equipment to see things with. And so, you know, Plato's thought is that we see these kind of like shadows of the real thing. Right, like the way that I see like a person or a tree or whatever, I, that stuff's kind of there, but it's not like, uh, it's an imperfect version of, let's say like, like if I pick an apple, it's not like the perfect apple, you know, it might have a blemish on it, it might be like weirdly misshapen or something. And we have a very clear sense of that. We have a very clear sense of like, somewhere out there in the ether there's a perfect apple and it looks like this and this is my idea of it and then when you see a real apple you're like oh look at this thing this doesn't match what i think it should be but should it match i mean like that ideal apple doesn't exist how is that real right anyway that but if you if you think about it that notion that there is you know that you're only seeing shadows you're only seeing this illusion and somewhere out there in some higher plane there is the truth. There are ideal forms, right? So if you think about that, that actually reinforces certain, and it became very influential, certain ideas of Christianity, that this life here, the things that you see are not, that's not it, that there's something else somewhere beyond. And drawing and painting, they don't exist in a vacuum. They're this kind of expression of these cultural ideals that any given society has. And so if you don't think that this life is that important, let's say, or that, that, that this isn't all there is, and that there's something out there beyond that's more perfect, let's say it's the ideal world of forms, or let's say that it's heaven, right? Basically, the, the, the idea was that it became artist's responsibility to show glimpses of that more perfect world rather than, you know, in a way, kind of like all the stuff that we're stuck with here. If you think about how we even talk about certain things, like we say like, oh, like, you know, look at this little imperfection that I have, or, you know, like, I'm too short, I'm too tall, in relation to what? In relation to some ideal, right? And part of that is, you know, people started to codify this into a kind of, uh, in kind of moral language. So not only do you want to show that ideal world, you are doing a greater service to humanity by showing, you know, like that, even that idea of like selecting the best, most perfect parts from different models to show a more perfect version of humanity, right? 
And the idea that there's even like a perfect kind of humanity out there. The visual, you know, sort of um, equivalent of that are at least for most of you know this whole um, period of academic artwork are Greek sculptures. You know, the antique. That's why the antique is even a thing because the antique is this sort of physical manifestation of Plato's forms, of this perfection that we could maybe aspire to. And maybe we won't have it, but our paintings can give us a glimpse of that. Again, you carry it further, you associate it with Christianity, you are getting closer to divinity by doing this. Now, that affects the way that you draw. So, for instance, if we pull up um, this drawing by Yegorov, Already, you know, they're, they're, they don't see, and this is like an early 19th century drawing, they don't see that much value in drawing the model exactly the way the model looks, right? And so already here, the model is corrected based on the antique. The features are regularized to meet this certain ideal. You know, out of the chaos of nature, you know, when you look at a real person, like the abs might be irregular, you know, like there might be like a little fold here or something. You might have chest hair. A lot of people have chest hair. And yet none of that is here. And I'm sure that he saw that stuff, but the whole impetus behind that is to take this messy reality that's only an illusion anyway, and to make something clear and coherent out of it. And that's the whole essence of the spirit of classicism anyway. It's to take chaos and make order out of it. You know, in this completely uncertain, you know, world of all this, all these things kind of screaming out at you at, at all times, to create some kind of order out of that chaos, something that you can hold on to, some kind of universal truth. Because that's what this becomes. It becomes this idea of truth. And then, you know, you read in 19th century literature, all the artists can't stop talking about that. Truth, beauty, beauty, truth. And so the thing to realize about that is that it has all these assumptions behind it, right? And that might not actually be what we want to do necessarily, but that's what people are thinking. Right. So, OK, there's one layer of idealization here. He's already turning him into like Zeus over here. You see that? And, it's like, and again, like, these always have a little narrative like these are like, I don't know, like clouds behind them, I guess. I can guarantee there were not clouds in the studio, you know, when he was drawing this model. And even here, you can see actually this like schematic based on the antique. I've seen this before. This I call this the moose antler. It's basically this very clear conceptualization of the visible ribs under the pecs that you see a lot in Greek sculptures. Like almost every male Greek sculpture that you see will have some version of this. You can see a slightly more complicated version of that in the Laocoon and a number of other sculptures. But again, that whole idea of there being some higher reality that we can maybe glimpse if we just try hard enough, that filters its way into drawing. And that is part of why, you know, the, he's making, Yagorov is making the choices that he's making, right? And that's why neoclassical drawings look so foreign to us, I think, because as a culture, our ideals are actually somewhat different than that. Um, basically, what, because um, what people were doing at the time is they were creating these, you know, these figures to represent gods, right? To represent nymphs, to represent like all these mythical creatures and you know, basically not people the way people usually look. Um, I've devised a little test for myself that, you know, one of the things that kind of like just clearly kind of gets you on the same page as the artist, um, let's call it the pubic hair test. If a drawing of a model has pubic hair, there is some bit of naturalism creeping in. And the same goes for all body hair, really. Um, you don't see that in a lot of these drawings, not really. You know, you might see some of it, but it's not... Basically, to them, this model was a vehicle for, they were extracting the universal qualities out of this person, right? Like, what this guy actually looks like doesn't matter. Because if they focus too much on representing this person exactly as, as they appear, let's say, uh, for at least the way that we would draw it, let's say, you don't end up with a picture of Greek gods, you end up with a picture of a bunch of people in togas. And so there is... And let me show you actually an example of that. Um, I'll actually back up for a second. This is a uh, late 19th century drawing from the, um, I think it's one of the smaller Ecoles, not the, you know, not the big, the, the big Ecole. 
But see, this is completely different. This guy has a hairstyle. He has like a specific hairstyle. Um, you know, he clearly has body hair. And there's a kind of idiosyncratic quality to the folds on his body. It's not like the Yagora where everything is kind of like neatly planned out and he looks like a building almost. This is, you know, a more commonplace sort of, uh, sort of reality. Again, you know, this is the same impulse. Organizing all the forms in nature to make them into something legible, something coherent, like making something out of the chaos, right? This is just accepting all the chaos. This is just chaos. Give it to me. Love it. Um, there is simplification, but it's mainly based on like value control. It's not so much based on actually modifying the forms. The forms are accepted such as they are. And again, this is a persistent theme all the way through these. Oh, actually, this is an interesting one. This is uh, this is by Paxton. Um, Paxton was one of the Boston painters, very influential. He was one of the people that trained Gamel. Gamel was basically the the fountainhead of the uh, of a lot of like sort of modern site size based atelier movement. Uh, but it, it's sort of interesting because Paxton is not a particularly good uh, figure draftsman from at least from a structural standpoint. You know, like. Uh, neck, for instance, you know, requires some explanation. Um, you know, same thing with that hand and all that. But anyway, we won't get into we won't get into Paxton today, other than maybe to say that um, <laughs> I just found this thing that uh, it's in a book written by Gamel about Paxton. You know, everybody talks about Paxton as you know the link to Jerome, the link to the teachings of the occult, and basically when. When, uh, when Paxton was leaving Paris after four years with Jerome, he went to see Jerome and he showed him some work. And Jerome said, you, these don't show any of the promise that you showed when you first got here. And that was apparently like the last thing he said to him. Uh, so, you know, there isn't a, <laughs> there's, there's a bit of a break in that link, you know, between, um, the teachings of, you know, Jerome and the Ecole and, you know, sort of what that transferred over to Boston um, and those painters. But anyway, you know, let's say we look at this, right? This is uh, it's a, just a painting of uh, Venus and nymphs bathing, right? And again, very idealized in a number of ways. It's idealized in terms of the forms. Everything's sort of regularized. These are not people that you would recognize. They're sort of ideas of people. Like, you, you, know, that, you, know, you know that they're human. Like, they have all the parts that they have. But they're not a specific person. And it's the same thing with the landscape. You know, this is not a real landscape. This is, you know, it's an idea, it's an abstraction. You know, in a lot of modern drawing, there's this idea that, you know, oh, you have to get rid of all these symbols. You can't think about symbols. Sure you can. You can just develop these very sophisticated symbols. Or you could forego the symbols entirely and just depend on your subjective impressions of, you know, uh, the jigsaw puzzle of shapes and the retina. You can do that too, you know, but that's a, it's a different point of view. Now, speaking of Gamel, there's an interesting, uh, you know, I just, I love historical gossip. So here's a little bit of that. Um, let's see. So this is Gamel uh, in his book uh, about the Boston painters. There's a website called bostonschoolpainting.com that actually has a lot of his writings. And he's talking about Edmund Tarbell. Right, who was one of the people that taught him. Edmund Tarbell was an American Impressionist. He was you know, part of the Boston School. The, you know, very good painter in that vein. Made a lot of, um, you know, a lot of painters that are, a lot of paintings that are very sort of Vermeer-esque. Like, I mean, that was kind of like the, you know, he, Vermeer was one of the idols of the uh, Boston painters, as far as I understand, especially Paxson. But anyway, you know, he is generally classified as a Boston Impressionist. His concern was primarily with these two-dimensional phenomena. If you look at how he simplifies a hand, you know, it's simplified as silhouettes of color, right? It's not, he's not thinking about tendons. He's not thinking about bones. He's not thinking about any of that. He's thinking of certain shapes of a certain color in a certain place, the end. Okay, well, apparently at a certain point, and this is something that teachers would do a lot, um, Tarbo was around with a friend when Lefebvre came by to offer some advice. Right. So like this guy was like, oh, Mr. Lefebvre, can you like come on down to my studio and like, you know, just kind of take a look. Right. So Lefebvre dropped in uh, to Chris as a canvas the young man was working on from a posing nude model. Picking up the palette and mixing a tone, 
the master quickly brushed in a hue which, to Tarbell's amazement, unerringly matched the color of the posing girl's flesh. And this is uh, Tarbell talking to Gamel now. Now will you tell me, Tarbell concluded with the rhetorical question, will you tell me why in the world the man who could do that went to work and painted the chalky nude holding up a hand mirror in the Luxembourg? He was referring to the then celebrated picture entitled La Verité. I held my peace, this is Gamble talking, but my own long preoccupation with symbolism, as well as with mural painting, had taught me that had he painted impressionistically, I would say optically, but it's basically the same idea, to use a word that he would not have understood in our sense of it, Lefebvre would have ended up with a picture of an unclad woman, which was not his purpose at all. His aim in this instance was to depict a female figure in a manner susceptible of suggesting the remoteness and dignity of a symbol. So in a sense, like this figure of, um, I think it's a figure of truth. Um, oh, it is. Okay, so this figure of truth, it's, it's kind of more like a sphinx or like, you know, again, like old mix sculpture or something like that, rather than like a portrait of a, of a given person. Um, so he says, this withdrawal from everyday reality necessitates adopting a calculated color scale for the flesh tones and generalizing the structural forms of the body. Aesthetic devices which Lefebvre utilized extremely knowledgeably, although perhaps not triumphantly in this instance. Now, these objectives are alien to the Impressionist endeavor, which, as we have noted previously, aims to report the immediate impact of something seen and observed by the painter in its envelopment of light and atmosphere. Both ideals have suscitated great works of art, but each should be given, each should be judged by its own criteria with the painter's specific intent in mind. So that, again, goes back to what we were saying um, over here. This is basically what he's talking about. This is Ned Tarbell over here. This is Lefebvre, right? They're both abstractions of reality, but they're abstractions of different parts of reality. So when you look at the Tarbell, it's realistic in a sense, but it also, you know, like these hands are like mittens. You know, it's like they're not, you know, they're sort of like paper, paper mittens, which is actually a, a criticism that people had of Sargent's portrait of Koalas Duran, that the, um, that the hands look like they're made out of paper. Now, this is the figure of truth by Lefebvre that Tarbell was railing on. So you notice, this doesn't look like a specific person. It doesn't quite look like a Greek sculpture either, but it's not meant to be a specific person. You know, these are clearly feet, these are clearly legs. They're not really any one person's feet or legs, but you recognize, you know, the figure as human. The landscape is basically made up. You know, this is just, this is purely conventional, right? And you know, the same for a lot of Lefebvre's other paintings. You know, a lot of them are formulated along the same lines. Now, okay, and again, here's another look at this nymph painting by uh, La Grenet. Now, what happens when someone tries to approach this kind of ideal subject from a more, um, what you might call it as a kind of like a, a scientific, like materialist point of view, basically with the development of, you know, greater individualism and with the scientific revolutions that happened after the Renaissance, this whole platonic idea of, you know, in the ideal world of forms or even the idea of like heaven, you know, and there being another more perfect reality, this started to kind of break apart. There was a kind of secularization that happened, you know, particularly in the West. And so, you know, you get these, in a sense, you kind of get people that don't believe in mythological figures or don't believe in nymphs or whatever, and they're painting nymphs anyway. And sometimes it turns into something like this. Oh my God. This is Julius the Blank Stewart. It's called Nymphs Hunting. Oh. This is not a painting of nymphs hunting. This is a painting of two naked ladies walking dogs. <laughs> oh my God, that is awesome. You know, and, and that's because, you know, Julius Blank Stewart did not have the same, he had the wrong philosophical commitments. He didn't see the world in a way that would allow him to make this kind of picture and have it not be ridiculous, right? Like, if you, if you don't believe the world you, that you're espousing, it's going to seem silly to, to, to other people, right? Um, in a sense, like, this is actually not that silly. I mean, there are things about it that are, like, are these birds? No, not really. I mean, there's symbols of birds. But, um, but this makes sense in itself, and it expresses the idea that it's meant to express. And so does the Lefebvre. The Lefebvre might not be to everyone's taste, but it doesn't make you laugh. 
it doesn't make you laugh in the same way that this does. And, and I think that's a big part of it, is that basically the, the whole project of modernity, like one of the, the maybe the biggest changes, the biggest shifts that you see, say moving from like the Renaissance to, you know, throughout to like the end of the 19th century and even beyond, is that that faith that, that people had in finding universal truths, in finding these things that are permanent, because that was a big part of it too. You know, if this life is not all there is and it's not the most important thing, you know, what they're looking for is permanence, something you can hang on to that's always true and form supplies that. You turn on the lights, you turn off the lights, the form is still there. But for instance, the idea of a, like light, capturing light, light is fickle, light changes, right? The outside contour of a model, the, the way that it looks in silhouette, if you move, if you, the model moves a little bit, that changes too, right? And so I think that what, what happened is that people really favored things that were, that they could grab onto, that they could sort of turn into principles or rules. And anything like color, like light, the, or, or an individual person's appearance, everything that was too worldly or that changed a lot was seen as sort of unreliable and also as kind of morally wrong in some way. And I think that's why you see this tendency towards idealization in these earlier paintings. Because again, it's part of this entire worldview. It's just a reflection of the culture that, that created that, that work. Now, as time went on, and again, you have to get the, all these advancements in science and science providing all these answers and, you know, um, eventually, you know, um, individual like workers and stuff getting like some amount more power and, you know, different forms of like um, democracy and sort of more civic participation in, uh, in politics uh, emerging, you get this greater concern with the individual and with life here. And so you still get religious paintings and stuff like that, but a lot of the, the focus shifts to celebrating life as it is right now, right here in front of you. And you can even, uh, you think of the pre-Raphaelites, you know, John Ruskin's whole credo of like, you select nothing, you reject nothing. You can't actually do that, that's impossible. But they were selecting different things at least. You know, they weren't consciously trying to order things in the same way, or they weren't consciously trying to change things, right? They might leave a few things out, but they weren't trying to modify what they were looking at. They wouldn't take a model and say, Oh, legs are too short, gotta make them longer. Um, and so, again, because I think to us today, that sounds ridiculous. Like, if you, there was, um, there was a thing that would come up a lot, because the, the culture students and atelier students in general were sort of terrible. Um, you know, they were just these kind of frat houses where painting was done sometimes. And so, you hear these stories that on Mondays, models would show up and they would take the stand and the students would be like sort of jeering them. It's like, oh, look, look at short legs over here. Or like, oh, like, look at this person, like, blah, 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 blah. They have really big feet. And so and this is like what models went through, by the way, like every week when the model was being selected. Um, and so, again, when you think about that, that presupposes that there's a certain way that people are supposed to be and that this one particular person doesn't match that ideal. And we still get that, you know, even with like, fashion and beauty standards today, like it's an idea that it's, it's still persistent in what we do. And yet to our credit, I think, I doubt that there is anyone in any atelier working today that would <laughs> invite a model to pose, uh, you know, for the class and say, you know, your legs are really short. <laughs> and if you know somebody like that, well, I would cut off all ties because they sound terrible. But, um, but I think again, that's been part of the shift. And so by the time that you get to the later 19th century, the idea is largely to celebrate the individual physiognomy of each person. And so you get this kind of, um, here, let's go, let's go back to that. So instead of searching for these universal qualities, instead of searching for, you know, the things that everybody has in common, the search is for differences. The search is for what makes that person unique. And so, again, you go from something, you know, like this, which is, uh, this is by the granddaddy of, you know, sort of 19th century academic work. This is by Vion, who was the preeminent painter of his day. He trained David, he trained, you know, Vincent and Regnault and all these other people. Our, our sort of very realistic, um, well, realistic in a sense, uh, our sort of current notions of, you know, that 19th century naturalism, it, it actually kind of springs from this guy. 
he was a uh, director of the Academy of Rome at some point and actually, uh, you know, was the one that created the requirement to paint a nude figure from life, you know, as part of the things you had to do if you won the Prix de Rome. So anyway, with that, you know, again, later on in the century, let's see, let's, um, again, you get to something like this, like this Croyer, right, where every bit of this, and if you read anything about, you know, what Bonat and Jerome and, um, you know, all the sort of teachers around the time were, were working with or were telling students, character is a lot of the, a, a lot of, um, uh, the, the subject of what they talk about. They want it to look exactly like that model in the sense of capturing like the things that make that model different from other people. And so, in fact, this is this is sort of an interesting one. Ang had a saying that was uh, the saying was basically look for the caricature in each person. Right. And so they actually had like in at the Academy of Julian, they actually had like on one of the walls this quote uh, written on there. And they had a bunch of caricatures like of, you know, like different people. And again, you see that as um, let's see here. Let me show you something else that's uh, interesting. Now I know it's just been, you know, again, very sort of meandering over uh, like fifty thousand different disciplines. Um, but hopefully, some of that is you know, sort of coalescing a little bit more now. Uh, this is something that the historian Albert Boyne uh, collected. Uh, he uh, passed relatively recently. He was one of the one of the people that sort of led the charge to uh, reevaluate 19th century um, artwork and to, you know, create more scholarship around that um, in the 70s, I think. And um, he has a book about the, um, you know, the French academic work. It's a, it's a pretty good book. There are some things that are a little questionable. Um, I have a few other books by him where he engages in a little bit of uh, psychoanalysis of Aang. You know, just some of it gets really weird, but, you know, 70s, whatever. Um, Anyway, so what he found here is actually, and I can actually, I can send this out to you all. Um, it's just freely available online. Uh, first of all, this is a pun. Uh, second, this is, he, he got in touch with Agus Chavard's family. Agus Chavard was a student of Aang, and basically they kept all of these drawings um, that he did, the very first drawings that he did under Aang, and like the last drawings that he did before he started, uh, before he was allowed to paint, right? right? And so you get to see like his very first, oh no, his very, very first um, study that he did under Aang. Again, like what we were saying before, and I think this is usually the trajectory that most people follow. You cannot contend with all of the facts that you see on the model. Like you, you can't, you know, no one's sitting there like, I don't care how, you know, photorealistic someone's work is. No one's sitting there like rendering pores and atoms and like, you know, these infinitesimally small structures that make a person. There's a cutoff point, right? Where you're like, okay, that's, a, that's enough. And there's certain conventions that you accept. The drawing's not gonna move. It's, you know, gonna be in black and white or whatever. What's happening here, as I see it, is that Chavard, can't contend, can't create a sort of coherent story out of all of the facts that he's seeing, all of the different properties that he sees on the model. And so it's sort of like scattered around, right? There's no sort of story hierarchy for the values. There's no, you know, sort of like this leg doesn't even match up. You know, this part of the leg and this part of the leg over here are completely disconnected. This is 1831. As the year progresses, he gets a little bit better. This is also from 1831, okay? There is more coherence here. You know, the values are organized into at least two groups. Um, you know, it looks like a lot of these areas are organized like through sort of longer rhythms in general. Start to get here, and this one apparently got um, Aang told him that he had drawn an excellent figure. Okay, <laughs> I don't, I don't really, uh, I don't see it, but okay, fine. Um, and you can see that, again, there's like a little bit of sort of scattering. He's not quite making sense of all the different tones that he's, um, that he's seeing on, on the model. There's a kind of a, you know, he's sort of overwhelmed by all of the, all of the information. But again, progressively, this is 1832. This is like a year later, right? Getting progressively better. And again, telling himself a story about, like, let's say, like, oh, there's a line of action that goes all the way through here and all the way down there. 
does the line of action actually exist? No. The line of action is this abstraction that we come up with. You know, if you, you know, if you were to say, you know, have this arrangement of these forms like this, and you ask somebody, let's say this is, you know, a necklace, and you ask them where the string is, pretty much everybody would say that it's right here, even though there's literally nothing there. Like physically, there's nothing there, but we're really good at finding patterns. Um, and again, you know, it's like everybody sort of instinctively is like, oh, no, there's, there's a pattern going through here. Uh, that, it seems like, is what's happening in, um, in these drawings, that there are certain principles that Aang is telling him to look for, and he's finding them, right? So you see, like, this is um, circa 1832, so it's like, you know, like a, a year or two in. Um, here's a little uh, stump patch. It's probably like a little bit of black chalk that is, you know, getting picked up with the stump and applied to the stuff, um, to the modeling here. You can see that there's a lineup, you know, going through here, all the way up this way, and all the way wrapping around here. Again, there's greater coherence in all of this. Um, now here, this is a quote from Aang. He said, in a strong man, uh, search well the Herculean character. Right, so like, you know, look for the qualities that sort of create that uh, archetype. Now, that, um, interestingly enough, dovetails with these drawings by Rubens. These are drawings of the Far East Hercules. And it's basically this block analysis of that sculpture. Rubens supposedly wrote a book about, um, like a theory of figure drawing, I think it was called. And there's some copies that apparently survive. They're like, they're like, it's like a copy of a copy. The attribution is sort of doubtful. We don't know if he actually wrote this. Um, this stuff is his apparently, but the, the whole book, who knows? Um, in any case, you know, here it's a search for character, not like an individual character. It's more like an archetype, right? Now, again, this is kind of universal archetype. Again, like strong man, Hercules built like a box. Um, when you get here, what Aang is telling his students is to find that kind of character, that kind of archetype, or the type, in an individual person. You know, this, this guy doesn't look like a Greek, a Greek sculpture. I'm sure this guy looked just like that, right? And anyway, as you keep going through this, it's a really interesting document, because again, it's like, you get to see how, you know, these people were not just right out the gate you know, producing these um, really accomplished figure drawings that were, you know, perfect examples of their master's principles. You know, it was kind of slow going. Uh, 1832, so this is about like, you know, after a year. Um, and as we keep going, you notice like, you, you know, there's, again, more the clearer abstractions, like say lining up like the entire um, area of the clavicles across like one straight line. There's very clear simplification of the tones and the shadows. There's a sort of snaking path you know, all the way from the head down to the ground. And uh, boy, he notes this, he says, the artist is now searching increasingly for geometric harmonies. And again, you know, by the time we get here, I mean, this is, uh, you know, 1833, 1834. This is basically the end of his, uh, you know, this, uh, of his period drawing with Aang. And by the time we get here, he's more or less ready to paint. And this is his first painted study that he did with, um, they did in Aang's studio. So, in any case, you know, what, what I want to sort of uh, end on is that the way that you draw and what you decide to put down when confronted with like a, a piece of paper and a model, there isn't one way to do it. The whole sort of project of academies has been to try to figure out some, you know, again, sort of universal principles. But academies are pretty open to change, like more so than I think most of us give them credit for. And so the academies, what they're for, they're for taking information, kind of packaging it and transmitting it, right? And so what that information looks like, it varies depending on the culture that produces that academy. Um, this is, you know, an interesting sort of walk down um, academic memory lane. These are the winners of the Prix de Rome from 1864 to 1968 when the prize ended. Um, 
And again, you know, you see a certain tendency towards idealization here. You know, these are not, um, you know, this is Homer. Um, it's not exactly like, you know, an exact portrait of a model. You see that here too. You know, these are not, uh, these are not the same thing as, um, as that, you know, Julius LeBlanc Stewart, right? And, but interestingly enough, again, academies are sort of vulnerable to these outside forces. So eventually you start seeing like a greater naturalism creeping into these where like the, you can start recognizing the models after a certain point, um, which may or may not be a good thing because they only have so many models. So at a certain point you start realizing that like both of these guys are probably the same guy, you know? And, and again, you start actually approaching, you know, the, what we might call the, the uncanny LeBlanc Valley, uh, you know, where like they start to look a little bit ridiculous and, but sort of before that happens, a more sort of realistic, uh, or I don't even know what you would call it, like a, again, a, a more sort of a, a more maybe earthly sensibility takes over. You know, these people don't look like gods anymore at a certain point. Um, let's see. So, you know, right now we're at um, 1886. So let's keep going down. Here, pointillism makes it into the scene. And this is uh, 1889. I mean, this painting, if you were to see it up close, it's not a great reproduction of it. It's basically made with like little, you know, grain of rice type of brush strokes. And so even the sense that there is a clear academic tradition is actually, it's kind of flimsy, honestly. Um, here, you know, you look at, you look at this painting, this is from, um, what year are these from? These are from 1891. That looks, you know, like an actual physiognomy of somebody that hasn't been corrected through the antique, hasn't been filtered at least in that way, not through this kind of it's mostly New Testament stories too, right? Um, I'm sorry. Isn't it mostly New Testament stories? It looks like later oh. in this, like near 1890. You know, I was a terrible Catholic when I was a Catholic, so I actually don't know. But uh, well, less Greek gods, right? Oh yeah, that that for sure. Well, also it was sort of the sensibility of like, what would it be like if you were there? you know, rather than like this sort of further removed kind of thing. It's basically interpreting biblical events as historical events, like things that actually happen. What would it look like if it actually happened? Um, not this one, <laughs> but this one's very firmly in the sort of idealized camp. Um, anyway, as you keep, you know, going down, we're going to speed up a little bit. You start to notice that, oh, uh, this was that really sad story of uh, Jacques de France, who, you know, like died like as soon as he got to Rome after, you know, trying like five times to win the prize. Um, again, very sort of, um, you know, sort of impressionist or sort of luminist kind of approach to this, um, you know, something that would make, you know, Monet proud. You start getting over here, like a different kind of idealization takes over. And then slowly, year by year, you know, the trends start changing and changing and changing until at a certain point, we, we're, we're clearly out of the sort of naturalist sphere again, and now we're in a different kind of, um, of idealization or a different kind of abstraction. You know, here, like, the, the color is not the kind of impressionist color note sort of thing. Um, that idea is sort of gone, it seems. And as we keep going down, like, for instance, like this, this, this assumes the character is sort of, of an icon. Uh, this, by the way, is one of my favorites. This is by Odette Pauvert, who was the, the first woman to win the, the Prix de Rome in uh, 1925, when they finally, after like 300 years, decided that women could compete. Um, and anyway, so brace yourselves, because this is about to get really weird really fast. Um, this is a Prix de Rome winner, okay, in uh, 19, 1928. But at a certain point, they just dropped the whole biblical thing altogether and just let people choose whatever story they wanted. This is a pre Rome winner. This is a pre Rome winner. I mean, this is like unrecognizable at this point, right? It, and it happened like pretty gradually. So, but I mean, you think about what happened in the interim. Like this is, this is just as World War II is, Actually, this is during World War II. I don't know how they managed to keep the prize going in between, but uh, no, World War II, okay, World War II, they had the Prix de Rome, didn't stop. Um, you know, there was more of a breakdown of that kind of certainty that we can make scientific progress, that 
things eventually are looking, you know, looking up that that we're constantly striving towards something better and better and better and better and better. There was a lot of disillusionment in the year because we just had two world wars, right? And so these paintings, in a sense, are kind of about the breakdown of that. It's people sort of embracing a kind of subjective, uh, you know, uh, perspective very uh, wholeheartedly, because, you know, in a sense, that whole idea of that, that uh, enlightenment project of, of progress, I think. Um, I mean, it hasn't completely run out of steam, but I think that there was um, a loss of faith in that. So anyway, this is a Free to Rome winner, 1960. Wow. Again, you know, and, and this is the 1960s. Like, this is, you know, you're entering this sort of period of postmodernism at this point. Like, you know, it's sort of like, a, you know, relativism is sort of like in the air. This is kind of like, do whatever you want. Like, you know, everybody has an individual perspective. Everything, everyone sees things differently. There's less of a kind of like uh, community sense of a shared shared vision in that um, in that sense. This is a this is like a this is like David Lynch's pre to Rome painting. Uh, oh my god, that's crazy! And this is the last winner of the pre to Rome. This is the last painting that won the pre to Abstraction. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and it's like the Academy was a little bit behind. I think by 1968, this painting was already. This is not like cutting edge, you know, but. Um, but the whole thing with the Academy is that the defining feature of the academies has always been eclecticism. It's that they're not tied to any one thing. They're always trying to synthesize everything. The first kind of idea in general was, you know, like the, it's like that refrain you hear, the, the drawing of, um, of Michelangelo and the color of Titian, right? Academies have always been about taking these disparate parts of knowledge, of human knowledge, and trying to combine them into something. And, you know, tossed around with a few other ideas, uh, like maybe you know, providing works for the state and elevating public taste and whatever. But um, in any case, um, this all this to say that there isn't one answer to what you do when you step up to draw a model. And then again, we've never been more free to choose what it is that we want. And so I think that as we all go on about our work, it's useful to think about like what motivates you, how you think about the world, what's important to you because that will have an impact on your work and you know whether basically nobody gets to not have a philosophy you have one or you borrow one from somebody else but if you don't consciously think about it you're just going to be subject to somebody else's philosophy which might be fine but um it's not uh i think it's worth thinking about because in that sense that is maybe that maybe that's where we're at and then that's what the that's the value in what we do. In a sense, you know, we're all sort of, you know, more or less hairless monkeys sitting on a rock in space. You know, like, why does any of this matter if we're, you know, smearing mud on a piece of wood or wood pulp or whatever? But I think that, you know, from a purely, you know, sort of local human perspective, the stories that we tell, the individual stories that each person has to tell, the individual experiences that each person uh, has had and wants to communicate to other people, there is tremendous value in that. It's not necessarily this grand sort of like, you know, um, completely groundbreaking thing, but it's a kind of like quieter value that it has. And anyway, so to, to conclude this, um, I want to read you this little quote that I thought was really, uh, really cool. So I'm going to be that guy that ends this with a quote. Um, this is by George Healy, who is an American student of... Uh, of Grow, and he was a friend of, uh, I think he was a student of uh, Della Rocher a little bit too, and he was a friend of uh, Thomas Couture. This is, uh, he wrote memoirs, and you can read them online, it's completely free. Um, and he says, <clears throat> as I look back upon my long life, as I think of the early years in Paris at the time when Grow killed himself, but Grow was one of the casualties of that sort of a uh, romantic neoclassical debate. Um, you know, he, he felt like he didn't live up to, you know, uh, the the ideals that David had set out for him, and uh, he faced some sort of public uh, disappointments, and he threw himself in the river. Um, but anyway, as I as I think of the early years in Paris at the time when Gros killed himself, when Delacroix, that audacious young innovator, excited the anger and contempt of Ang, when the landscapes of Corot were refused at the Salon, when my old and dear friend Couture was considered a revolutionary spirit not to be encouraged by the authorities. I can but smile, a little sadly perhaps, at the violence of the young men of our day, 
who in their turn will be looked upon as old fogies by the youth, the youths of 30 or 40 years hence. And so the world goes on. Fashion changes. The beautiful of yesterday is the grotesque of today. What matters it? Each generation, as it, come, as it comes to life, does its best, struggles, suffers, hopes, or despairs. It adds its little stone to the big edifice which is ever being built. The little stone is lost among others, forgotten, overlooked, but it has helped, nevertheless, to make the wall solid and beautiful. And that surely is something. Wow. So uh, I figured let's, uh, let's open it up to, to questions if you guys uh, have any. Thank you, Ramon. That was amazing. A lot of uh, beautiful and interesting information. <coughs> Anyone have any questions? I don't, know. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> oh, what was the last reference, Ramon? The last reference, the, uh, you mean like... The like, author. Oh, the author? Uh, George, George Healy. Okay. Like healing, but heal E with a Y. Um, here, let's uh, let's pull him up. George Healy. He's uh, largely like an American portrait painter. Um, oh, painted Lincoln. Yeah. So this was mostly what he what he dedicated. So he lived in Paris for uh, for a long time. Yeah. Here's a a Lincoln by him. Um, I wonder if he actually. I'm not actually sure if he painted him like. Eight, no, 1869. I guess uh, Lincoln was alive. It wasn't like a after the fact um, sort of thing. Yeah, but um, well, let me uh, let me actually go and um, grab a little bit of water. And if anybody has any more questions, then we'll uh, we'll go ahead and tackle those. Okay. Good. Sounds good. All right, I'm back. How are the cats doing? <laughs> uh, Meepo booted Cooper off of the uh, off of the bed. Cooper is on the couch now. I don't know if you can see him here, but yeah, they're both uh, they're both asleep. They're both um, in that sort of like roly poly position. I love it. <laughs> Any other questions, you guys? Did you get that, Ramon? Ramon? Oh, I, uh, I actually couldn't. I can't hear like that well, oh. and the, the audio doesn't carry through that well. But uh, do you mind just? Uh, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the person can come up closer, or if you want to just like summarize the question. Yeah, like school, in the school environment in the 19th century, mm -hmm. um, conflicts mm -hmm. of, I guess, aesthetic conflicts between mm -hmm. students, um, what kind of conversations would have been had, you know, about stylistic con differences, mm -hmm. philosophical and stylistic differences. Yeah, like in the way that we argue. Okay, yeah, so. That we argue about them now. Yeah, that that changed uh, quite a bit throughout the century. So, at the at the very outset, you know, this this is this stuff kind of comes in waves, right? And so, <clears throat> you have at a certain point, like let's say in the 18th century, you have the excesses of the Rococo, like which the Rococo is just kind of like, you know, version 2.0 of the Baroque. It's all about like exuberance and kind of excess and. You know, it's a very specific kind of sensibility, right? Like, if you could characterize it with anything, it would be like a cornucopia, right? Um, the Baroque and the Rococo are not about streamlining things. Yeah, they're about, you know, sort of plenty. And, you know, you think about the rulers at the time, like, they had tremendous wealth, you know, the, which eventually led to the French Revolution. Neoclassicism is more about paring things down, about going back to something simpler, about streamlining, organizing things. It's not about plenty, actually. It's about fewer things. Um, it's about discipline and it's about order and clarity. 
but that impulse, you know, for that kind of exuberance and that kind of, you know, zest for life in the here and now, that never goes away. And so, for instance, like in the beginning of the 19th century, like right around like the 18, 1810s, 1820s, you have these very spirited debates about, um, you know, between like the, you know, the romantics and the neoclassicists, uh, Delacroix obviously being at the helm of that. The, but even that is similar to an earlier discussion that's been going on for centuries, honestly, between um, this idea of color versus drawing, which, which I think is not phrased very well. But basically what it ends up being is like, there are people that favor these kind of transient aspects, these things like, you know, really vivid color and like, you know, a lot of movement in the paintings, a lot of like, you know, sort of like maybe sometimes even violent subjects and things that are difficult to capture because they're so transient. And there are people who are really interested in um, representing things that are permanent. Right. So drawing was seen as one of those things that drawing tells you the truth because drawing um, in the sense of like form, basically, forms don't change. You know, if you look at a person from a different angle in the room, you know, the sort of the, the shape or the contour will be different, but the form is always the same. And so that was you know, that's part of a persistent debate that keeps popping up. Now, later on, what's interesting is that that sort of a, there's a kind of dual awareness for a time where like that kind of classicism or neoclassicism started to erode because even when teachers or artists like made, you know, um, these very stylized paintings, very idealized paintings, you know, for their artistic work, they were making these very naturalistic uh, studies or academic drawings in class. Right. And so there was a kind of disconnect between what they were doing in the, in the life room and what they were doing afterwards. Um, so I think that was actually part of, uh, you know, so, some of the, you know, the debates going on. There are a number of other things like later in the century, of course, there's like the whole, you know, commotion with like impressionism, which is again, sort of similar. It's, you want to focus on these things that are ever changing that are sort of here and now, you know, or do you want to focus on these things that, you know, sort of, are eternal in a in a sense, and again, it just sort of switches back and forth. Um, now, when you get to the later series, like students were not supervised a lot, you know, like the teacher would come by like twice a week, and so you're you're there with like your you know other uh, colleagues like the whole week, and you know you're smoking and you're drinking sometimes in the class, and you know like uh, throwing chairs and having paint fights and whatever. But also, you know, sort of hotly discussing like different theories and that kind of thing. Um, another one of those debates was the idea of whether you could just, you know, whether you had to draw at all or whether you had to, you know, like follow this kind of mosaic idea like they did in Corrales Duran's studio that you could just put down these spots of, you know, uh, the exact color and the exact tone and, you know, by doing that, like produce, uh, produce modeling. So. That was another one of the, the issues at the time. Um, and eventually, students got really sick of the whole, you know, sort of idea of idealization to the point where, you know, a lot of them were just making, well, like Julius LeBlanc Stewart, you know, they were making these things that were just, um, uh, what would you call it? They were just extremely realistic paintings. Like, no one wanted to make anything like this after a while. It seemed to them sort of like artificial in a way. But um, there's an interesting quote, actually, because, again, part of the theme of all this is that nothing lasts forever. So here's a, I have a book in front of me. Um, it's um, written by George, uh, George DeForest Brush. His daughter, um, you know, put together these like recollections of his. And he was a student of, uh, of Jerome. Right. And he had this to say, like many, many years after his time at the occult. He said uh, about Jerome, he was one of the kindest men and I believe the most intelligent master then to be found. It is not his fault that I refuse to call those years spent at the Beaux-Arts training. Nothing is sadder to look upon than the misguidance of serious old men leading enthusiastic youths youth astray. And this is all that an academy of fine arts has ever done. This is by someone who went to the occult and he, you know, was not, uh, 
he definitely had a sort of reevaluation of uh, what he thought of the school after a while. He said, never did a man fill his position more, more faithfully and more earnestly than did Jerome. Never did a young man of pupils work more enthusiastically to bring about the decline of the fine arts than we did. Never did a government lay finer plans on paper than the French. Nor was any academy more liberally conducted toward both the, toward the foreigners as well as toward the French pupils. All the world realizes, however, that something is wrong when they go to the annual exhibitions. The something wrong is that the art of painting cannot be kept alive by the methods employed unless the government can supply the youth the subject. It is a little use to furnish the means of acquiring the art of imitation, for the very kind of imitation which became popular was precisely the kind not wanted. We were taught the art of painting some monks in a wine cellar, a priest in a garden with a red umbrella, a man being shaved, a moor being executed. The better we learned to do these things, the more we were unfitted to do a noble subject on a wall. They are two different arts. So basically, for a while, people were doing these ideal subjects, and that was supposed to be the sort of height of achievement. Then people got sick of that, and genre painting took off. You know, people were painting scenes of everyday life, like, you know, Bassin Lepage's paintings, like Malay's paintings, and like, uh, even like Viver's paintings. There was this whole uh, theme of historical, um, historical like reconstruction painting. Um, and in fact, speaking of um, paintings of monks, Antonio Casanova did probably the best uh, anti-clerical paintings mm. that anyone ever did. They're just paintings making fun of monks, basically. You see uh, monks being gluttonous, you see monks drinking, you see uh, monks behaving extremely inappropriately. Uh, you know, and then there's just sort of like a goofy, you know, um, they're kind of poking fun at, um, you know, at the at the clergy, right? Like this is not what monks are supposed to do. Um, the issue with that is that after a certain point, certain people like George the Fourth Brush thought that this was trivial. Like they thought that these paintings were basically not worth doing. You know, like sort of like yes, yes, you learn how to paint, but like for what? To paint some monks like hanging out in a wine cellar, which actually here's a monk in a wine cellar. Um, and that became, you know, part of the issue. Like, uh, I think he, George the Forest Brush, did more sort of monumental work. Um, so again, you get this kind of like shift from like, okay, we want to focus on everyday life. No, we don't. We want a noble subject. Actually, yes, we do. We want to focus on everyday life. No, we don't. We want something more transcendent. So I think, you know, and again, the methods evolve to go along with that. It is difficult to paint, you know, something like a Kenyon Cox painting. Like say like one of his like, like you, you can't paint this, you know, from a sort of optical or impressionist viewpoint. It, does, it doesn't make any sense. And again, it ends up just being like, you know, naked people in togas or half naked people in togas. Um, it doesn't have the kind of character of a symbol that this sort of requires. But um, those are, I think, some of the, you know, the, the main issues that were, you know, very hotly debated actually in the studios. Awesome. Did that answer your question? <laughs> okay, thank you. Do you want to? Oh, who painted the painting of Icarus? The painting of Icarus? Uh, did I show that here? Isn't that the guy, the nude with the wings? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, Lying down. Uh, this one? Yeah. yeah. This is uh, this is Morpheus. I think he's like the god oh, of. Morpheus. Uh, this is by uh, Jean Bernard Restoup. Uh, here, let's uh, Jean Bernard Restoup. I believe he was actually uh, one of like the earlier, um, you know, people who turned toward neoclassicism. So you know, he was trained basically as like a Rococo painter and then, you know, gradually created work that was a little bit more streamlined, a little bit less uh, indulgent in, um, in that sense. Cool. You know, the weird thing is that, th again, this is probably painted from life. Like it, it's just done on a very different sort of... Um, uh, principle than, you know, the work that people do today, for the most part. You, know, you don't really see, you know, a lot of, uh, 
you know, Morpheuses that look like this, you know, and sort of a, on Instagram at least. <laughs> Any other questions, you guys? I think that that's about it, Ramon. Oh, okay. All You're right. For right. tonight. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Thank you so much again. Thank you. No, but thank you all for having me. Um, the next one is going to be a little bit less abstract. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, what we're going to do is we're just going to track, you know, how these drawings change just in the 19th century, you know, from, you know, basically one trend to another one, which is actually still plenty to talk about when you look at how different these things are. This is David. Uh, but yeah, it should give us, um, I think it should give us some good, some good food for thought to see how we get from this to that. Is that a highlight on the, um, is that a highlight with white chalk? What is that? It, it, I'm not sure what it's done it with. It looks so crudely applied and doesn't really match like the- It, it does and it's also rare for the time because people stop doing the white heightening. Like- And it, it's nowhere else. It's only right on that pectoris, on the pectoral. It's weird. Yeah, I, I, it's, yeah, it's one of those weird things. Like I have no real explanation for that. You don't see that very often. It's actually it's actually rare to see a figure done on toned paper at this point. Um, they stopped doing that after a while. They started just working on white paper. This is from like the 1870s. Like it's just this is sort of this is this is an anomaly. <laughs> this is definitely yeah. an anomaly because this is what you expect these things to look like. Right, right, right. Uh, and actually, you know what? Before we go, just one one last thing. This is sort of a a fun little addendum. Um, I found this book that it, it's all in French, but it's a it's a pretty interesting uh, document. It's by uh, Charles Alberti, who I think was, I don't think he was French. I think he might've been from the, from the Netherlands. Um, but anyway, he was um, a student of David and he published a drawing manual with, you know, it's like broken down into like several lessons. There's some interesting things that he talks about. Uh, it's very elementary, you know, it's just like, you know, first order of business, like how to draw straight lines, how to draw like inclined lines, how to draw like rectangles, how to combine them into triangles, how to draw curves, um, you know, how to draw parallel lines and keep them straight, how to, you know, like oh, draw different kinds of lines. So like how to curve them, how to go from like, you know, light to dark, how to go from thin to thick, you know, how to like, you know, like cross uh, rectangles and stuff. And then like how to make shapes out of those lines, right? And then eventually it gets to how to make forms out of those shapes. So it, it progresses like very sort of, um, you know, very, uh, very clearly and very systematically from one exercise to another one. Uh, here you see him like introducing like 3D and talking about perspective a little bit. Um, finally, we get to instead of shapes, now we have 3D forms. Keep going down, this is like, you know, some botanical stuff. Uh, I don't know what kind of animal this is, but. Pitbull? <laughs> yeah, it look, yeah, it looks like a, a dog, I guess. I don't know. Um, then you start getting into like the human figure. And it's interesting to see how influenced this is by that kind of tactile um, sensibility. You know, they're like each of these patch marks is a, tr a trail of sort of like a, again, like a rake when you're sculpting, um, you know, to, you're following along the form, uh, holding an ear. You know, a lot of it is, again, like very sort of conceptual in that it's not just, um, well, it's weird to see it coexist, you know, because you'll have stuff that's purely like sort of shape driven. And then you have things that are just like purely, um, you know, conceptual. So like, like all of this, which is like actually seems really impractical. Very cool. And you know what's interesting about this too is that there's actually a whole, uh, in one of the chapters when he starts talking about rendering, which is the one that we're coming up on right now, um, he talks about using he talks about stumps, talks about leather stumps, talks about paper stumps. Eventually, they stop using the leather ones and they only use the, the paper ones. But one thing that he talks about is um, wrapping your index finger in fine cloth and using that as a stump for the shadows. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, like, it, you know, they have these, like, weird sort of, like, you know, DIY solutions for, uh, for working, you know, like, earlier in the century. Um, this is interesting. You see these things pop up a lot, you know, and, like, centuries and centuries through centuries and centuries you find all of these like um you know sort of a, like constructive heads you know they're, they're, like this is how they were able to idealize all the forms because they had a very clear 
notion of drawing independently of the model. Right. But um, anyway, as we get further down here, the so he talks about how they can't reproduce, like, work with the stump, you know, at least not back then, not with, like, the lithographic technology they had. So, you know, his drawings have hatching in them, but he tells the the reader to render these with a stump. So oh, interesting. Okay. They just, they just couldn't, they didn't have, like, you know, yeah. they didn't have the technology to reproduce smudging. So it, would, it all had to be, like, done with lines, basically. Um, so as we go further down, further down, further down, this is uh, this is where it gets really good, actually. Well, first of all, I mean, th this is a little weird. This is like more sort of conceptual measuring than than you would really think would be practical. And it's a kind of conceptual measuring. It's just like arms are usually this long. It's not like based on a specific model that they're looking at. And then here's the rendered version. And then this is, so here's another one. And this is probably my favorite one. Um, can't rotate this here, which is really annoying. But um, but basically, you see like an encapsulation of like all of this, where basically you have the, all the markings are made with this kind of tactile point of view in mind. Like they're, they're not the boundaries of half tones or the boundaries of shadows exactly, but they're the boundaries of forms. So every form is largely sort of outlined. And then here you see like again this very conceptual basis for uh, for all of that. Um, you know, figures in perspective, you know, et cetera. And then, you know, it has, like, different proportions for different people and all that. Um, you know, anatomy, which, again, sort of questionable at times. Yeah. Like, with that skull, you know, I don't know how how helpful that is to to anybody. But anyway, as, like, somehow these people picked it up. Like, this is Kenyon Cox who like somehow picked up all of these, you know, sort of very ideal conventions to create this work that was again, very sort of like conceptually based. And the, the last thing I'll show you all here are um, some drawings by, some drawings by Adolphe Vaughn that again, are sort of, um, sort of surprising in how they're, uh, well, you'll see. Uh, let's see, so historical construction, and Adolphe Vaughn was um, Sargent's pretty much only drawing teacher as far as, uh, I think as far as we know. Um, you know, he might have studied with Leon Bonaf for a little bit, but that's not something that he did for, for very long. So that, that nighttime class at the Ecole that everybody continued to get into, you know, that all, like, all those drawings that everybody admires, like, they're all from that class. Um, Adolphe Vaughn published a book, right? And these are some of the examples from the book. Okay. So he was, a, he was a student of Delaroche along with Jerome. And so somewhere along the line, like, and this is again, this is like the only guy that was teaching the Coles drawing class, um, at least for like 20 years from 1863 to 1883. And he kept teaching for a while after that, but then, you know, changed this a little bit. Um, and he's literally telling students to like think of a cylinder, not not to draw a cylinder, but to actually think of one. And you know, this is it's just weird to see that the person who made this very idealized, very sort of neoclassical head, this was the person who trained, you know, all of these um, all these artists that were making um, things like that. You know, it sort of makes you wonder like what the what the teaching consisted of, or to what degree. He says something like, these um, these ideas should be burned into the student's mind, like sort of upward-facing cylinder, downward-facing cylinder. That makes sense. Yeah, so in any case, yeah, uh, we'll get into that more next week, but there there yeah. always seems to be something of a, of a conceptual basis, you know, underlying a lot of the stuff. And again, reaching back for like centuries, these are like 500 years old. You know, people have been doing this for, for a long time. So. Well, awesome. Thank you so much. I know. Thank you for coming. And we'll see you next Monday. All right. Sounds you good. Thanks, Stephanie, for all your help getting the tech organized. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.